Now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex. This is the Ramble. We go until midnight tonight from New York City. Now, the gentleman there is very special in my life. You have fired me how many times? <clears throat> At least twice. At least twice. Um, and and uh, and yet we still talk to each other, and we're still friends, and I like him a lot. Well, the feeling's mutual, and I think a lot has to do with the fact that I owned up to the fact that I I made a really big mistake. <laughs> no, yeah. and I'm not I'm not ashamed to admit it. Well, you made you, know you made the decision you had to make at the time. It seemed right at the moment, right? Well, there's lots of things that were going on at that time that I've never spoken publicly about. Um, you know, as you get older, you know, we're just talking about how, how we're both aging. Yeah. I, I look uh, yeah. at it like I look at it like I'm growing up and I'm trying to understand myself. And I and I look back and I say, well, I can't believe I did that or I can't believe I did this or what an idiot I was or whatever the scenario is. Pretty hard on myself. Mm -hmm. But basically the story is at that time uh, I inherited a very poor radio station uh, KITS at the time before we brought you on right and uh, then we brought you on and mm -hmm. it was basically we have Alex Bennett in the morning and this whatever we're doing the rest of the day and it didn't really have any um, it didn't really make a lot of sense you know in terms of what we were doing yeah uh, so the music didn't ma the, the music didn't match the personality. The stationality didn't match the yeah. personality. Yeah. The, the imaging, the brand, was was askew. It just didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It was this teeny bopper. If you have zits, you listen to kits. That's how we were being attacked on the other side. So when my middle daughter was born on September fifth, nineteen eighty six. And, I got, and that was my first GM job. You know, I think I might have been the youngest GM in San Francisco. Right. Maybe has San Francisco history. I was 31 years old, and I, I didn't know my ass from my elbows. And uh, I'm thrown into this situation. I took the job probably because no one in that town was going to work for as little as I was willing to work for at that time. <laughs> but the thing is, is that we were in kind of a desperate situation. Um, we were thrown in that situation because the ownership at that time was he was very worried about uh, Paola Plagola, mm -hmm. and so we were competing against KML, and we couldn't play Thriller uh, unless his secretary called all the all the Tower Record stores in the area in the Bay Area to see what kind of sales they were getting on the 45s. So it had it had to show up. So it took three weeks to add a song. When in CHR, the other guys were adding it right away. They were right adding out of the it box. right away. Yeah. So, so we got our ass kicked, and, and it was really no way to compete head to head as a CHR. So I had to flank everybody, but I didn't have an owner that really understood what we were doing. I had an owner who didn't understand what you were doing, because but, no, unless we would have gotten that sweetheart deal from the other company to pay what forty or sixty percent of your salary. You create what you did with me was what they do in like with football teams and baseball teams and so on. You were saying you would take. They didn't want me. Okay, and you would take over my contract uh, for what you were you were going to pay for sixty percent of it, or what was the deal on that? I think I was paying sixty percent, and they were paying forty percent. But they didn't like that deal; they wanted fifty fifty. Well, and they you said you would give them fifty fifty until I beat the ratings or or equaled the ratings that I had at uh, at their station yeah but you did that in three weeks and I did that in three weeks and they, yeah, yeah, they had to much. keep paying me yeah, 50 yeah. percent for the next right. What, right. year and a half but, or something but but to get back to this thing like no matter what you what people think of me 
or what you think of me or what I've done in my career. Uh, I mean, I've always prided myself on on being honest, forthright, being a stand-up person. Like I said, admitting when I've made mistakes and a lot of different things. Honesty was a big part of that. Integrity is a big part of that. And yeah. I talk about that all the time. Yeah. Yet here I am finding myself changing a format without the owner's permission. You snuck it past him. I snuck it past him. And, um, you know, at that time, it was like if the if uh, Philadelphia calls, don't put him on hold. I don't want him to hear you know, what we're doing. <laughs> they, they wouldn't have understood it. What he told me to do was I said to him, we're going to make some changes on the air. And he said, well, make some incy beansy tiny changes where the listener doesn't even know what you what you're doing. Well, you know, that's not really making a change. We really had to hit people over the head. We come out the station that dares to be different and we're going to be milk toast isn't really going to work. So the issue was I was hiding this and it really went really went against my core principles and it bothered me and it wore on me. And while everybody in that building was having a great time because I really think I I created an atmosphere where everybody could be who they are and we were wild and crazy and uh, a mm -hmm. kind of classic and it, you set the tone in the morning for what you were doing. Um, it, it bothered me. It really bothered me. And uh, eventually it wore me out because I was, everyone was having a great time except one person in that building and that person <laughs> was me. Oh, geez. But I've, ne I've never expressed that. And I think yeah. that's where I kind of got to a point where, uh, you know, until his son, uh, uh, Joe Field's son took over, no one was really going to understand what we're trying to do. I mean, I would talk to him about marketing and they would send me a bill board from Philadelphia or a TV spot from Philadelphia that had very little to do what we were really actually trying to do. So again, I, I think that that was a major cause of my, my burnout. And I think I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I didn't make great decisions at the end. And um, I, I kind of left on my own to kind of start something else and go into bigger and better things, which eventually happened, but not right away. Yeah, but at the time you got rid of me, then you were in the middle of all this angst. I was. Yeah. Yeah, I was. And and the thing is, what's interesting was, look, and I take responsibility for it, but there were a lot of people in that building who came to me even that morning and said, yeah, you know, you're doing the right thing. You know, you're doing the right thing. And then after it happened and it exploded negatively, it was like, oh, that asshole, I can't believe he made a decision like that. You know, that kind of stuff. But that's life and that's the way, that's where it goes. And yeah. that was the hand I dealt myself. And uh, it took me a while to... Um, uh, basically, to come back. Yeah, basically you were keeping from the people in Philadelphia the fact that you would change the entire format of the radio station. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, the funny thing was, uh, the morning that happened, the, the Arbitron rep, Arbitron was the rating service at the time, a guy named Marvin Korab, calls, uh, calls the owner of the company and congratulates him on, on the format change. <laughs> <laughs> so remember this incy teensy little but i heard that at one point he that the listener should know about at one point he finally came to the station he heard he it and said well it's working so what can i do what happened was he came and he was staying at the uh, fairmont and i picked him up in the car and i drove him we, we were kind of silent we didn't i didn't turn the radio on <laughs> and I, I uh, and I dropped him off so he could drop his bags off, and then we're going to go to dinner. And he goes up to his room, and I turn the radio on, and here's Steve Masters broadcasting live from some club in Palo Alto, and the song is "Oh Oh Oh, Feel So Good." Oh Oh Oh, Feel So Good. And I'm saying to myself, "Oh my God, if he goes up to the room, turns the radio on, I I'm not going to be long for the world." And uh, he came down. And he looked me in the eye and he basically said, well, you went too far. And uh, and then the, you know, the, the lesson you learn is the next one who speaks loses. So I shut my mouth. Yeah. And then he said, I'm not saying you did the wrong thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but still, you know, uh, again, when you when you I have integrity. And I, I talk about that all the time, that, that that's something I protect with my life. And here I am lying through my ass. Yeah. And uh, 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 because I kind of felt I had to do that 
And if I didn't do that, there wouldn't be Live 105. It wouldn't have been this thing that we created. Yeah. But, uh, again. It became uh, a very successful radio station. A, a very successful, iconic brand uh -huh. um, that's still an iconic brand because they they had changed the name. It's kind of like uh, uh, Coca-Cola changing their name to become uh, Jolt Cola, you know. Yeah. They have a successful brand, and then they changed the name to Alt 105.3, and then they changed the format, and they called it Dave FM. I have no, reason, I have no idea why they called it Dave FM, but they called it Dave FM. And uh, the ratings plummeted, and then they brought back Live 105 in a broom closet, okay, because it's all in a, on a computer. And the ratings went through the went through the roof because they brought back the iconic brand. Yeah, but you know, yet the brand they brought back was they did not bring back Live 105. They just brought back the name. Well, remember the people who remember Live 105, or we're going back uh, 1986. It started. So what are we? Almost 40 years. So those people who were in their 20s are now in their 60s, and you know. Um, so I think that some new discovery from some young people who might have heard about this great brand, you know, got in the mix, and uh, and and they're certainly doing better, certainly doing better. But my suggestions were that they they didn't go far enough. That they they should have called you up and brought you back for a week. You could have broadcast from New York, or, you, or a, a, a big big bring back Big Rick Stewart, Steve Masters. Uh, some of the iconic people who were on that Instead, station. Instead, they didn't bring back, back any of those people. As guest hosts. Well, that would cost money, you know, to, to go do that. Unless you want to do it for free, I'll set that up for you. <laughs> I'm doing this for free. I understand that. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm happy that the, the people who started the station and were associated with the brand um, got some recognition for the fact that it was iconic and it is legendary, and, and bringing it back just sparked some in, increased interest in the radio station. Yeah, yeah. Because the people who we worked with at that time were outstanding people. They were great. That whole staff was unbelievable. As a matter of fact, when I left, and the I handpicked my successor who came in, Pat, mm -hmm. okay, uh, what did he do for the next five years? He didn't change a thing. He no, he brought, he brought me back. Actually. Well, he brought you back, and he was a hero for that. But he kept every seller. Uh, one of the, Freddie Abner was there for over thirty years. Uh, he kept the marketing people with with with, with Gabby. Well, uh, his his old he, feeling when he brought me back was, let's get the gang back together. Right. You know, and so he made sure that all the people that were there were the people that were there prior to whatever nonsense went on they called it pirate yeah. radio at one point and you know no, we, we know all we did was we mimicked the um the sl uh, slogan of pirate radio pirate that, radio that, that was it yeah. something uh, uh renegades of the airwaves we had a billboard i think that's all we basically said yeah uh, to do that but uh you know that was it but uh, again he was smart to keep those people because those people were great they loved what they were doing as I said, everyone in that building was having a great time except one person. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. Because I was ill-ridden by what I did. Now, should I have been? Well, once he came, once he came out and he heard what you were doing and yeah. he said, well, it's working and, you know, you better be glad it is, uh, then you should have had a certain amount of relief. No, because you know, what am I, I'm supposed to call him up and tell him, uh, oh, Alex wants... Uh, um, interview this person or that person and then the other thing you have to understand is you were having a great time on the show in the morning mm -hmm. you had yeah. all the, comics it's the best on time and, I ever had everybody else right and then when you guys left I had to go clean up the mess with the Chinese for affirmative action glad uh, <laughs> Macy's uh, Carlos <laughs> jr. I mean all the clients who yeah, were we did have a few about, we had a few problems had a few problems right the, Carl, we, the we Carl's jr. Right. thing was the best though they, they canceled. Yeah. They canceled because they had gotten like 500 letters or something, 
And then when we, we you went out and hired a, a, a detective, a private detective. I'm trying to remember who it was. He was very famous. Well, you call him Sam Spade, but I forgot his name. But yeah, yeah I, I don't but remember he was his... like one of the most well-known detectives in the Bay what? Area. In fact, they had done yeah. some TV series about him or something. But anyway, he went and checked and he figured it out. It was one guy sending all these letters. And you you said to me something that was kind of interesting. You called me in and you said, we're having trouble with Carl's Jr. And I'm sick of it. Go after them. And you unleashed me on Carl's Jr. And so I went on the air and told this whole story about how they canceled their advertising because blah, 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 blah. And uh, eventually... Uh, the guy, the local guy who owned all the Carl's Jr. franchises in the Bay Area called him up, called up uh, Carl whoever who owns the company. Don and, Carter, I think yeah. it was. Why did yeah. you cancel? You're ruining my business. Right. And they caved. They absolutely caved. And they came back. And that was well, wonderful. That was a win a, for us. And Macy's did the same thing. You said... I just want you to know that Macy's does not want uh, listeners of uh, Alex Bennett's show shopping in their stores. So don't shop there anymore. Don't shop at Carl's Jr. There's, there's a lesson there, actually. And I think that um, this is really before the Internet, before things got really crazy with tweets and, and, uh, and, and, and all, the, all the negative social media vibes and everything else. We did it the old fashioned way. I remember we were carrying we asked people to send us letters and I'm carrying bags of mail and throwing it on buyer's desk saying, look, look at all the support we have, you know, in terms of being able to do it that way. But I learned a valuable lesson. And I think that the lesson was really true to my beliefs. Again, it's just be true and honest and just tell people what's going on. And, and, and by the way, you don't allow an advertiser to dictate your programming, you know, because well, if goes, you do, they will your, do uh, that goes back to uh, uh, those people trying to stop you from uh, promoting that uh, the famous comic. Yeah. That came into our station to protest. Sam Kinison. Yeah. Promoting a Sam Kinison concert in San Francisco. And they stormed in my office, which was the toughest day I've ever had a radio. This is, this is a great story, though. Uh, it was glad. Right. And they came in and they started playing excerpts of... Well, Kinnison's what, what act, they, which if you play an excerpt, you're going to have problems. But if you if you listen to what went on before that excerpt and after that excerpt, it then puts it in context and the whole thing changes. Well, there were about nine or ten people representing the community. It was the, like the Women's Morality Committee had shown I, up. I get you. But what they did do was, for my benefit, so I'd understand what they were trying to say. And, I, and, I, and they, they did make their point, and I respected their point. Yeah. There was a lot of gay bashing going on in town and this, that, and the other. And, uh, and, and Kinnison would make jokes about gays. So it opened my mind to really, you know, in, in reflection, it was, it, was, it was a good meeting. But what they did was they came in, and we had to be real serious, and they edited a five-minute tape of the best of Sam Kinnison. So we had to listen through the best of Sam Kinnison. Well, actually, it was the worst of Sam Kinnison in their uh, and, opinion. And, and, and as far as they were concerned. Yeah. Okay. Just listen to how, hor how horrible this is. And you guys are sitting there listening to it, trying to keep from laughing. Right. I had to cover my face like I had a cold or this, that, and the other. And then uh, once I kind of assured them that we had things under control, <laughs> you call them Nazis. No, I got up. I said, you know something? I, I just don't approve of this kind of thing. You're no more than a bunch of Nazis. Yeah. trying to dictate what we say and feel. And uh, quite frankly, I'm sick of this. And I got up and I left and I slammed the door. Sure did. You sure did. And, and I'm sitting there and with I, And I going, could hear them gasp as I did that. I'm sitting there basically, uh, they're looking at me like, so you have no control of this guy, do you? So the, 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 the point was that I said to them, thank you for coming in, you've enlightened me, okay? You're not going to change my opinion on what we promote and not promote, okay? But what they got out of it was they got a weekly show on Sundays. Remember that? Yeah, and and we also America. what we they gave, got, I'll we tell gave you, a platform. Well, the we thing was, platform. the thing was that I had always been a friend of the gay community in San Francisco, right. 
And one of the points I made it as, as I was storming out, you know, you're taking a friend and turning him into an enemy. And I said, you shouldn't do that. You should be very careful about that. And, uh, you know, after that point, I think I, I did some kind of promotion and donated $5,000 to GLAD. Uh, and uh, they were very happy with that. And I said, you're getting that not as a piece of guilt on my part, but the fact that I've always supported the gay community. And, you know, in fact, I always talk about I grew up gay because all the kids in school thought I was gay because my father was a musician and I went to the ballet, you know, and things like that. And so, what are you, queer or something? So I, I always like to say I grew up gay even though I wasn't, you know, so. Yeah. But that was a great story. And, and, and the lesson in both the Carl's Jr. thing and in that is you do not let people strong arm you into what your programming is going to be. You listen to their concerns and then you move on and do what you feel is best, not only for the radio station, but for, uh, for the community in general, you know? We did right by the community by giving them a voice, giving them a half hour show on Sundays, and we fostered a nice relationship, and it was great from, from there on. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I just, you know, I, I, I felt very hurt by that because they, they were doing something which I found disgusting, and they were taking a comedian out of context and then, you know, uh, uh, attempting to make a case taking him out of context. And I said, that's not fair. It reminded me of what they did to Lenny Bruce where the cops would get up on the stand and he always used to say, "Is nothing worse than seeing a cop doing your act," you know. Well, it's it hasn't changed much in forty years or thirty eight years, whatever. But look at look at the comics today. I mean, they can't they can't go to universities. They can't play oh, a lot of clubs. Bobby Slayton has quit comedy because yeah. of that. You know, it, it's just impossible. And uh, we've lost our sense of humor. There's no doubt about it in my mind. You know, and I, I see the comics we've got around today, and I'm going, eh, you know, it's, it's not. Bill Toast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In the late night comics. Or, but anyway, or, so this is the guy who I went through those wars with. Did that station make a lot of money while I was there? Compared to where it was before, yes, uh, because it was, it, was, it was in the shitter. Also remember that he paid... Three hundred and sixty thousand dollars for that signal in nineteen sixty-seven. Yeah, he had, he had virtually no debt service, so there wasn't a lot of financial pressure on us. Like you know, you got to. Although, if I wanted to give a, a receptionist a ten-cent raise, I had to go through him and, and argue with him about it. But uh, yeah, it made it made a lot of money, you know, relative to that particular time. But I think what what I'm saying is. At that particular point, it was really about to take off financially is kind of when I left. So I yeah. really left at the wrong time because I didn't take advantage of that. Because somebody I, somebody told me an enormous amount of money they said I made for that station every year, and I didn't quite believe what I heard. I can't remember what the number was now. Depends on who told you that. <laughs> if somebody said I made this station something like $40 million a year. No, no, no. 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 That was what K Rock was doing at that time in Los Angeles, um, probably within that period of time because it was in the largest radio market, um, and it was more established. You know, with how about uh, when I came back and Pat was the general manager? Did it do better than it was doing under you? Yes, yeah, because it was more established, and uh, the format was much more uh, accepted in in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Just remember, you know. The, the, the quake with which you were on all those alternative formats uh, were, were trying to find a footing because that wasn't what was popular at that time right you know, the album that was being played on the radio really didn't match that so it was virtually um, mostly unfamiliar songs and European imports and British imports and things that we were doing um, that was that was really different I, I'm proud of that I'm proud of that I'm proud of the fact that you know, I went there and I, I, I made a difference. I tried and we shook the market up you know, oh, a lot. Definitely uh, did. Definitely did. And I remember when I was at the Quake 
and they changed the format. They had been kind of a middle of the road rocker too. And then they changed the format because they hired this uh, programmer from LA who had done, uh, I think KLOS or what, what station, uh, K Rock. Right. And uh, all of a sudden one day there was this whole new music that we were playing and I loved it. I felt f where before the music didn't fit me, that that music fit me. It did. Yeah. yeah. But also remember though that radio at that particular time, um, I had to go to a place, I had to flank the marketplace because I couldn't compete head to head with, with a CHR or, or an AC or, or a, a typical classic rock station because those companies were just going to outspend us and we, we were not real players. So I had to go to, a, I had to go to a place where no one was going to kind of follow us off in the corner. And it took, it took time to build that corner to make it large enough mm -hmm. to be virtually successful. But, yeah. but, uh, but your first instinct, so if you have a good signal at 105.3, it's basically go mainstream, go AC, go, go, get, go with the broadest possible audience so you can make the most amount of mm -hmm. money. We, we couldn't do that. Because okay. we already got our ass kicked. Hey, listen, that. we've run out of time here, but why don't we stop at this point and we'll do maybe another little half hour here that we'll play at another time so that we can continue this story, which is a very complicated story about how radio stations work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll do another one in a couple of minutes here, but that'll play in about a week or so. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. That's Ed Cramp. Now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Yes, okay. I th hope you found that interesting. I mean, um, Ed, uh, Ed was a great general manager and knows his business and knew his business and uh, is uh, still a great guy. So anyway, that's, that's our story, and we're sticking to it, okay? And, and we'll probably have him back on you the next week or week after next uh, with the second part of that interview. But we re I really enjoyed having him on. Hello, everybody. How are you? What's happening? I'm trying to wake up here, so, you know. One day, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to do a show this late at night, okay? You know, you know. But uh, <laughs> for the meantime, let's take a look at uh, some of the people who are here. Uh, we have, um, let's see here. There's some, actually some good people here, to uh, tell you the truth. There's just a couple of them, but they're... They're terrific. And uh, let me see here. Let me just uh, do that. Okay, there they are. There's uh, Josh Wheeler. And there's Brian Neary. Hello, Brian. How you doing? And, um, I'm uh, tired. I just got home. Oh, just, just got home from Lodi. Hey, boy, I don't know why you just don't move to Lodi. You know? Oh, no comment. Yeah, no comment. Okay. Uh, and uh, thinking about it, thinking about it, you are thinking about it. Yeah, we've been negotiating lately, the last couple of weeks. So, who's negotiating? The company and me, see what my future is there, see what I'm going to do the last years of my career. Of your career, why you washed up, ready to retire, <laughs> ready to retire. And you're how old? 56, you know. It's not a bad age to retire, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello, Josh. How you doing? I'm good. Yeah, and how you doing? I'm 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 doing okay. Tired as usual. I don't know. I maybe I shouldn't do a show this late at night. Maybe I'm I'm just uh, it's 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 past my ability to do it at this time, you know. But anyway, we'll figure that good. one out. What? I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, uh, here's uh, our good friend, uh, uh, Alan, uh, who is uh, Alan W., who is uh, uh, just, uh, you know, an, another another member of our, of our happy family. And here comes Jason, by the way. Ah, owner. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't owner. see... Owner. We don't see Jason that often, but when we do, we are very happy to see him. Hello, Jason. How's it going? Yeah, how's your life doing? Eh, it's going pretty good. Wait a minute. Let me get this. Eh, 
It's going pretty good. <laughs> I thought you were going to, yeah. eh, not so good. Usually, eh, is followed by not so good. But you said, eh, it's okay. You know, there's, there's mixes to it. There's goods and the bads. You know, yeah. like, I got a nice, big, hefty bill coming in pretty soon because I have to replace my sump pump line. But, hey, I can re- hey, afford to replace it. So. The beauty of eh. home ownership. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a reason I never owned a home. I just didn't want all that crap, you know. I'd rather pay rent and call somebody to fix it. You know, so. but uh, so you need. Well, hey, my water pressure is awesome. But let me. <laughs> yeah, my water pressure sucks. Uh, um, so much for calling the landlord. Okay, uh, but uh, a sump pump. Now, how much does a sump pump cost? No, that all depends. Like, I replaced. My sump pump myself, I've replaced it like three times since I've lived here for the last like 12 years. <laughs> and uh, 100, 250 bucks a pop. But mm. I'm having the whole line redone, like going out my house and they're going to put in a new sump pump pit. And uh, it's actually going to be three sump pumps in the pit. And then 80 feet that they got to dig. I have no so idea gonna, what you're talking mm-hmm. about. Eight grand to replace what I got. Uh, eight grand to replace what you got. How about you, uh, uh, Brian? Do you have a sump pump? I don't think so. What do you mean <laughs> you don't think so? You got a house there. Sump pump is part of the uh, basement or crawl system to keep the water away from your foundation of your house. Mm. Oh, I, I got two see. pumps. You have two pumps. It means yep. you have a lot of water. That's right. Yeah. Mm. It's New England. Why don't we this yeah, we hour to make the, the, make the show completely different than it's ever been? Let's do talk plumbing. about nothing but sump pumps. The homeowner hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, no, I got stories. I could fill up that two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Telling sump pump stories. Uh-huh. Yeah, man. In August, we had this like horrible rainstorm and I've never, my basement has always gotten a little bit of water in it when it rains and stuff like bad rains. But this one was so bad. I had water spraying up through my freaking floor drains. Like there are fountains from freaking uh, Caesar's palace. Wow. Well, hold on a second. I got to write you, send him back a message. Now, let me see here. Sorry, I looked it up and I thought it was spelled that way. Uh, I can't do anything about the next time we run it, but the next time after that, I'll change it. Sorry. Okay. What I did is I spelled Ed Cramp's name wrong. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. It was supposed to be, uh, let me see here. That wasn't Ed Crump's? Cramp. Okay. As an apology, send him a sump pump. Huh? Yeah, as an apology, <laughs> send him a sump pump. Let me see here. Hold on a second. No, um, PH. Um, uh, P- PH. Uh, PF, rather. PF? How, how is it spelled? Uh, let me see here. It's not PH. Oh, oh PF. Not PF. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's not PF. It's... Uh, Oh, oh, no. oh, I see. It's, it's PF. I have it listed as PF. Well, anyway, I don't know. I screwed up. I'll try to fix it for next week. I'll go back and change it. Anyway. <laughs> oh, God. I spelled the names wrong. I did that. I, I do everything wrong. Anyway. <laughs> so for all of you out there, if you, if, you, if you watch the show again, just go up to your, get a little, uh, like, magic marker and go just uh, scratch out the way I spelled it. And it's uh, spelled, um, let's see here, uh, K-R-A-M-P-F. I can use whiteout on my screen. Yeah, uh, not, not, uh, not P, no. it, it's P-F, not P-H. Okay, good, okay. I'll I'll try to go back and change. I can't I can't really change it on the second one either. Hmm. Oh, I can try. I'll I'll worry about that later. Anyway, give me a challenge. Uh, give me a challenge. Give me something to do. <laughs> oh boy, I'm I feel bad about that because you know I've known this guy a long time, but it's always been a rough name for me to remember exactly how it's spelled. So, mm-hmm. 
everybody know that that uh, can change. And and by the way, I'm very sorry, Ed. If you're, I know he's watching right now, so you know. Uh, I didn't notice the difference, so we're okay. Uh, you you didn't notice the difference, right? Right. So it was a, it was a good uh, interview, though. Yeah. 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 Great, great stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, um, uh, so I'll have to go. Well, I can't change it. I have to go back and blank something out and put that in, and I don't know if I can do that. Could you maybe add like a black bar and then add text on top of the black bar? I probably will add a black bar. Yeah. And then add that mm-hmm. other thing on top of it. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, if I can't do it, I can't do it. You know. But I feel so bad that I had to. You know. So that I spelled it wrong. I always worried about whether I spelled his name wrong or not. And so I went and looked it up. And I guess I looked it up in the wrong place and got the wrong um, um, uh, thing. See here, here, here it is. By the way, folks, if you if you care to uh, if you care to know what I'm doing here, uh, let's see here, Ed. Where is it? Here it is. See there. Look at this. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There we go. See, there's the way I spelled it wrong. So I've got to go back and somehow change that. But I on the second one. So anyway, if I don't change it, I'll just tell everybody ahead of time. I put something on it that says, also known as, you know, so anyway. Um, so how are you all doing? How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah? You've been watching the news and things like that? A little bit. Not much today. Nothing much is really happening in the news, is it? I mean, outside of that, what yeah. do you call it, that uh, uh, yeah, the bridge? Yeah, the Bible salesman. Oh, well, the Bible sales. <laughs> that is funny as hell. The Christians are going nuts over him selling a Bible. No, they they love it. Oh, they is think that he, what it was? They think he's a real good Christian. That's why he's doing it, to get the oh, Christian yeah, vote. Yeah. Wasn't his hair different? Mm. What do you mean? I, I felt like it was, like, slicked down more or something. It was just, it looked different. I I hear if you, if you buy a copy of the Bible from him, you get a... Uh, a uh, a copy of the U.S. Constitution to read too. Oh, really? And I'm independent. Kidding, you know, he, does, the, he doesn't know it. Hmm. There is what is it? It's the Bible, the Constitution, the you know, Declaration of Independence. Everything like all in one. It, isn't that like the old saying? Like the the devil is going to come back wrapped in the American flag, holding the Bible. It's like he he did it. He's just he already like he's, has. He held the Bible upside down. Right. <laughs> hey, I swear I cannot wait till the commercials start coming out. Do you want to go back to this and start showing all the riots? Well, you know something. I don't know if that's going to do anything. America is stupid. It's just become inexplicably stupid. I mean, how can you even? For instance, here, you know what got me today? There was a cop that was killed here in New York City. Who shows up to pay his respects? The ambulance chaser, Donald Trump, who was taking advantage of the death of a, of a cop to help his, uh, his, his uh, run for the presidency. You don't use people for that. You know, that's terrible. It's horrible. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I have no idea what, why anybody even puts up with this guy or even believes in this guy. It just makes no sense. Where is Far Rockaway? What? That, that's where he was killed. He was killed on a traffic stop. Police officer Jonathan Diller yeah. was shot and killed during a traffic stop on Mott Avenue in Far Rockaway. Yeah. So and Trump also showed up. Where was it? Elsie showed up. Somebody else who got killed. Uh, yeah. And and he's just like he's like a he's a uh, uh, ambulance chaser, is what he is trying well, to get votes. While he was president, he wasn't very pl- pro police. So well, while he was president, he didn't go out when somebody got killed. No. Nope. You know, uh, but I mean, it just he. It, 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 Twice in two weeks, something like that. He's gone out to visit with people who have had someone killed 
there was that one person who got killed um, um, uh, by a uh, an a, uh, illegal immigrant. Undocumented person. A, undocumented alien. <laughs> A descendant from an illegal. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I find it. But, but you know, and I, I do respect the, the parents of that lady. You know, they came out and said, stop making our daughter's death political. You yeah. know, because it was a, a, a Venezuelan immigrant. Oh, did she that say that? Out. Yeah, the parents said, you know, stop making it political. Well, I wish they just told death. him, get the fuck out of my yard. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Uh, oh, but Trump's such a good guy because he went out to see this, the, you know, the wife of this of this policeman. You're right. What did he do for the police while he was in office? Nothing. Nothing. Bad know. mouth them. Did he bad mouth them? Yeah. What did he say? I don't remember exactly, but it's always like he went after the FBI at times, and he's going yeah, after yeah. other he, he different was police, and but he went after the FBI, get rid of them, yeah. get rid of all the cops. We don't need them, you know. Oh, get rid of the Justice Department. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I can see why he would be wanting to do that now. Well, sure, gangsters don't want the cops around. Yeah, you know. So I mean, it just, it just. It, uh, I, it, if if America votes this guy in as president, it's what this country deserves. Yep. And I don't know if you any of you saw um, the video of um, uh, what's his name? Um, Curb your enthusiasm. Um, what's his name? Larry David. Larry David on um, Chris Wallace's show on CNN, and he just said. They, he asked him point blank, "What do you think of Trump?" And he said, "He's a big baby." You know, he said he um, does nothing uh, to, uh, to. He has done everything he can to subvert this democracy by claiming, for instance, that the election was rigged. That, that totally undermines the democracy. And he just <laughs> went after him. And it wasn't like Larry David was being funny. The only time he got funny was at the very end after this this putting him down to a really heavy extent. He says, uh, but other than that, I'm happy or something like that, you know. But that, that was the only joke in the whole thing. He wasn't joking. Well, um, so well, anyway, I'm voting for Larry David for president, okay? So. It's a good choice. Huh? Hey, Jason, what, what brand sun pump do you get? Let's get off Trump. I have no idea. <laughs> I called up. It was uh, one of the bigger <clears throat> companies. That... I'm kidding, Jason. I'm just, you know. <laughs> oh no! Go ahead. Let's like yeah. it, go ahead. Ruin my show. <laughs> you were the one that said we should talk about something. I was joking. Oh okay. yeah, I joke sometimes. You know. Mm. But uh, anyway, again, my apologies, Ed. I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> I feel so bad. We fired about you that. two times. Huh? Don't apologize. What? We fired you two times. Don't apologize. Yeah, I shouldn't apologize. Yeah, he's the guy that fired me. Yeah. So yeah. Tell him he did it on purpose. Yeah. So. That's what you get, Ed. Fuck you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he has some good story. It's, it's cool to hear this little bit behind the scenes stuff. You know, well, so. I never really heard a lot of that stuff. You know, I didn't know. I knew. I knew that he had to go through a lot of hell. Okay, mm -hmm. as a general manager, and I and I often felt I've, I learned this. I don't know if I learned it from him or I learned it from somebody else, but uh, I I I always felt that the people who were my general managers had to really take the heat for me. I mean, I did the show. I maybe made some trouble, stirred up some trouble. Then I went home, and who was there to have to fight the fight? It was the general manager or my program director or somebody like that. So it what was What the hell? Did you think you were Howard Stern or something? Well, in San Francisco, I, I <laughs> there was enough trouble. Let me put it that way. I didn't go out of my way to make trouble. For instance, in the whole time I've been in broadcasting, I've never been sued. 
never once been sued. I've been threatened, but I never got sued. Okay. Um, Is it common in the broadcast? Oh, and what I do? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. I mean, Howard Stern, Stern got sued like crazy, or he got the FCC on his back like crazy. I can understand that. He's an asshole. Well, it isn't the fact that he's an asshole. He just took risks, and I I did care a bit about you know the people I worked with and that they had to put up with this stuff after I did it. You know, so I tried not to do stuff they'd have to spend too much time time doing cleanup work on. Uh, but at the same time, I had to do a show that walked on the edge. That's how you get listeners. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line you walk. You know, I often described it as uh, you it, you walk up to the edge of the cliff, and you look over the cliff, but you don't jump. You know, and 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 that's what you have to do. You know. You have to look like it's dangerous, but it's not. So, anyway. I don't know. Yeah. First time I met you mm-hmm. in Florida, mm-hmm. you were stretching the world. You were trying to get the hell out of there. I was trying to get, <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I meet you in Florida? Yes, I did. Really? Yeah, I listened to the show. Son of a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where did you meet? Come on, Jeff, tell us. No, I didn't meet him one on one. I just. Oh, he heard me on the radio. Ah. Yeah, it lasted all of what? Three weeks or something? No, no, it was. (laughs) I think it was maybe three months. Maybe. And I don't know if it was that. Yeah, I think it was maybe three months. Yeah. And then that was it. Oh, yeah. I I actually quit and uh, went home told my girlfriend uh, I just quit and by six o'clock the next morning we had packed everything up we were I had called the people to pick up stuff and send it to California and all of that I want I could I couldn't get to the border of Florida fast enough okay where's the coke where's the coke I'm in Florida I gotta leave oh there was coke, the coke. Down, there was coke down there you know but by that time, I had quit, you know. I would quit the minute I hit the, the uh, Florida border. I, I decided that I would no longer do coke because, I, I, you know, where would I find it in Florida? <laughs> where? Silly me, you know. Now where would you not find it in Florida? Well, you know something? It wasn't that easy to find. It's just that I knew comics who knew where you could find it. And But I just decided as long as I stopped and I wasn't, using it I wouldn't take it up again so I didn't really do it down there you know but uh, um, I like your story about when you were in Florida and the local police stopped you uh, because some lady called to complain that you said something nasty about. well they called the police to say that I was saying nasty things about the local police department right so they stopped me and they got the uh, they had a uh, uh, what do you call it a police dog dog yeah growling at me you know and I went well this is not fun and it was right after that that I said I'm out of here I just you know this is a, this is the last straw really yeah Florida is a one of the meanest places I ever lived uh, is it still mean down there Jeff it's strange it is strange, it's isn't different. it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's and down there because he's Jewish, and it's the law. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, and and uh, you go down there because it's warm during the summer, or during the winter. Yeah, and it it, it just affords you some sunshine during the winter. Yeah. You know, and I know a lot of people who live there now. Yeah, yeah. Permanently. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people move down there, you know, as they get older, and I understand why, you know. I mean, here I am growing old, and uh, the idea of being cold outside today, rainy, I didn't go out. You know, in the old days, it was rainy, it was snowy, I still went out, you know. I still lived the life, went to restaurants, went to movies, did a lot of things like that, went to clubs, stuff like that, you know. But as I got older... 
I don't want to go out. It's too cold. Oh, oh, well, it's summer now. Yeah, but now it's too hot. You know, so I Oy vey. Huh? Oy vey. Yeah, oy vey. <laughs> right. Now there are two or more oy veys and you're automatically Jewish. You know that, don't you? Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, I just, I just, I just, I, I've just gotten to the point where I'm, uh, I'm completely fed up with everything. Um, I'm completely fed up. Well, this this nation is. Somebody said we 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 have a, a, <coughs> a massive uh, memory problem in this country now. All of a sudden, this guy Trump, who was just horrible as a president. And all the things we hated about him and all the reasons why you didn't vote for him last time, all of a sudden, he was better than Biden. What? How You so? know, the thing I love, that the, the whole concept of this country was immigrants coming here from other countries because they were being oppressed and, you know, poor or whatever. But now it's happening again, and suddenly, oh, no, you know, Stop! Or our borders are being invaded. We're being invaded. We're being invaded. Well, you know, I, uh, being a Jew, I'm quite aware of the history of this country and how it treated the Jews during World War II. And you would think that, hey, you know, this is the place where immigrants come to get away from oppression and so on and so forth. If you got away from Hitler's Germany, there was no place for you to get here. They didn't want you here. There were whole movements in this country to keep Jews out of the country. Hmm. So when you tell me that America's land of the free, home of the brave, come on, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, that's bullshit. It's absolutely you know, they look my, like me. Huh? My mother's parents left when Hitler took over, and the only way they could get out was my mother's father was a medical doctor, and that hmm. was probably the only way they could get admitted into America. Because well, he had a trade that was needed. Well, I had a friend who had to leave um, had to leave Germany, and they had to go by way of um, Spain, because believe it or not, uh, what's his name, the, the head of Spain, uh, Franco, um, was the only person in the world who took Jews into his country. Yeah, he accepted one million Jews. Into, into Spain. Now he said to them, you got to leave as soon as possible because we can't take this kind of influx of people. But if you want to escape coming through, and he was also friends with Hitler too. So he said, Hitler said, if you'll take some Jews, we'll send them to you. And he said, send me a million. And then yeah. he then allowed them to, to leave and go to places like, the, in the I case of my friend, he went to Cuba and then got Cuban citizenship and then moved to the United States. And that was the way he could get in. But if he tried to get in going directly in through the through New York, uh, he would have never been accepted. He would have turned around, sent back. So thank you, America, for saving the Jews during World War II. No, actually, you were complicit in the death of them because you wouldn't take Jews into this country. So when we think of ourselves as a wonderful country, Come on, I got news for you. We got an inflated idea of who we are and who I, we I think were. A lot of Jews changed their last name when they came here. Um, um, yeah, so my name, my my, my 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 uh, German name was Smith, and then we changed it to Schwarzman. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, um, uh, yeah. I thought no. just a lot of them kind of spelled toboggan, so they ended up changing it to ski. Yeah, right. Well, no, what happened was. Um, um, my family name was Schwarzman, okay? And when they came here, they changed it for a short time to Cherney because they didn't want to be too Jewish a name. That's how difficult it was to be a Jew and come into this country. So uh, they did change, uh, the, the name was changed uh, for a short time. And then it, they went back to Schwarzman, you know, so. That was that, but they didn't. They didn't leave. They left after World War One, so they didn't have the same problem of coming in. They just went in through Ellis Island, and my my father, and oh, my was it my father? No, my father, my my uh, my 
grandfather and his other son, uh, Bolo, Boleslav, uh, came in through, I believe, the West Coast. And then my grandmother and my father came in through Ellis Island. In fact, I saw their name on the lists at, at Ellis Island. So, uh, uh, but they, and then they met in California. They had a place to go, so immediately they were let out of Ellis Island. They got on a train and they went to California and met up with my grandfather. Uh, and uh, so that was, the, that was the history of our family coming to America. But, you know, I mean, when you talk about immigrants, I mean, isn't this a country of immigrants? Yeah. You know? And and a lot of these people who are coming in from Mexico, you know, you think, oh, yeah, they probably just make, they're just taco makers, you know? Uh, but, no, there are doctors and there are professionals and all kinds of people who could add their worth to this country just like every other immigrant population has done in the past. Well, they add their worth because they don't think because they take the jobs that Americans <laughs> won't take. Won't like, take. Never mind. Well, <laughs> like working in the California Central Valley. Well, exactly. In, in I the, drive through Central Valley every day, and it's in, in the in the beginning. Uh, I, but some of these people, for instance, are doctors. Why should they be picking fruit? You know. But no. But but, but, but that, see, the, that's the biggest thing right now that's going on is the immigration problem is from Venezuela. We put an embargo on Venezuela because they had a Trump down there who said, I won, you didn't, even though actually the other person probably won. But he said, I won, you didn't, and he got to keep power. So we said, we're going to put an embargo on you. Now they're all coming here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but, you, you know, you get you know, Vietnamese. I know they, they're, they're the sneaking in because of the problem that's going on at the border right now. But you know, a lot of Vietnamese they come here and they're doctors and lawyers and stuff like that in Vietnam, and they'll come here and work assembly jobs because they want a better life for their kids. You know, as a and, and, and that's make. really what it should be about. I'm so, yeah. I'm a union person. I'm a very strong believer in the union. Right. Come yeah. in here, and you work the fucking grunt job, so your kid can get a better job, and their kid can get a better job and that's that's i'm a product of that my grandparents came over here my grandma was an illegal my grandpa was a his parents were border jumpers to have him over here because here the bar crossed him or not or whatever i don't know but from where my grandparents had to work and do what they had to do to what i do you know it's you work your way up you work your way up the ladder don't hire freaking you know, engineers to come over here, hire fucking laborers to come over here and have them grow up and their children become more and become more and become more. That's the American dream. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in California, especially in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of Indian from India uh, engineers. They graduate more electrical engineers than we do in our country. And they're bringing them over here to we shouldn't do and build whatever you know in Silicon Valley. Develop them here. No. Don't import. Don't import the high wage jobs. Import the low wage jobs and raise them up. Educate them here, so then our people can do the what we need them to do. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. This but, is where I have to be quiet. <laughs> what, what do you mean you have to be mm -hmm. quiet? Right. Because of work. Really. Okay. Because of work? I mean, well, how's that? Well, I don't understand how that. Well, because he's a boss and he hires people. And, you know. and he probably imports people from other countries. <laughs> well, you have the V, those 401, what do they call them? 401 visas or what do they call them? What, 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 what 409 or 409, something. The, the work visas? The work visas, yeah. And what you have to do, that's been terrible. That, because what happens is, People get to come in if a company says they need a particular skill, and this that person has here. has that skill, and uh, they need them, and they can't find anybody else to do it or something like that. So then they they bring them in, mm. and they work them at a company, and then they're slaves to that company because if they don't get along with the company or they send them back they want to quit the company and go somewhere else they're immediately kicked out of the country 
along with so, their families who they brought over here. Am I right about this, Brian? Visa? Is, 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 what's it called? It's a certain kind it's of a visa. 4019 or something, isn't it? It's a work visa. I, I don't know what it's called, but I just know work visas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but see, that, that's what I'm saying. It's just instead of sitting there and saying let's bring in all these people who already have the education who probably actually could live a decent life in the country that they're coming from I, I say kind of fuck that bring in the people who are willing to do the grunt work you want to be the laborer you want to work in the fields you want to fucking you know pour the concrete you want to do that Find kind of phone stuff poles that. and work on phones well, the yeah. other day the other day i was watching <laughs> kristen welker on uh, meet the press and she was interviewing this woman who they finally fired from nbc after one appearance somewhere. That's a quickie. What, what's her <laughs> name? What was her name? Uh, um, she was from Michigan, wasn't she? Yeah. She was the former head of the uh, Republican National Committee. RNC. From Michigan, wasn't she? Yeah. 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 And uh, she was interviewing her. And at one point, the woman said, you know, and then we got all these people coming in over the border bringing uh, 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 fentanyl. The fentanyl. It's always the fentanyl. So. And God bless Christian Welker. She was the first person I've heard absolutely challenge that notion. She said, "The fentanyl isn't coming in through the, uh, through uh, the Mexican border. It's legal coming ports of entry. Legal ports of entry. California from China. Los Angeles is the biggest producer, not importer, but producer of fentanyl in this country. Which who? Los Angeles." Well, they get the the stuff to make it with get, from China. No, it's, yeah, it's just narcotics. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, they but get it from other countries. To begin with, I've made I, in. I, yeah, Los I've, I've often kept asking the question: How is fentanyl coming in through the Mexican border? Are they bringing in backpacks across the Rio Grande? Are you oh, kidding some, me? Huh? No. But the majority of them are no. coming from freaking freighters they, and they, trucks. They're coming in through legal ports of call. You know, and and so she she knocked her off at the knees on that one and said, you know, that's not true. They they coming in more from places like Los Angeles and other ports like that than yeah. coming across the Rio Grande. Yeah, and uh, that shut her up. She didn't uh, mm -hmm. she didn't challenge it. You know, but that's the lie they're trying to make everybody believe. I mean, yeah. we have all these catchphrases: fentanyl. Oh my. God, you know, that, I hear lots of country, yeah. right? You know, murders and rapists. Don't forget that murders and rapists. I mean, with shirts on, Alex. The murderers are the ones with the murders on the shirts. Rapists yeah. to the left, murders to the right. Fentanyl, you stay in the middle. Everybody, yeah, come yeah. on in. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I need four rapists and two murderers. Remember the history of the world. Yeah. You're a bullshit. I'm a philosopher. You're a bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just, I just, uh, uh, but I, I have to hand it to Christian Welker for, for yeah. holding her feet to the flame. But Christian Welker was in a bad situation because she, she was told to have this person on, who is now an employee of NBC, yeah. and and she was supposed to interview her as her first interview under the new job. Well, then of course, every right after the interview, Chuck Todd started laying into NBC about hiring this person. And then everybody else at, at MSNBC started doing the same thing. Joe Scarborough went after NBC. Rachel Maddow went after NBC. Um, I can't remember how many other people, but most of the staff hmm. of NBC. Just, just about everyone. Huh? I said just about everyone. Just about everyone. And they rebelled right. against NBC. And NBC finally said, sorry, I guess we made a mistake, and they fired her. Well, now they owe her $600,000 because That's she was going to thing she, that nobody wants to really say that. She was going to get, she was going to get $300,000 a year for two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And it was a no-cut contract. And so they signed the contract, and then they fired her without cause. Okay, oh, wow. she, she didn't do anything wrong. She was just the asshole she's always been. Okay. Well, then that's when you also fire the person who made that agreement. <laughs> well, they no. That person is going to become the head of all of NBC soon. I mean, wow. yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, I mean, uh, you know, so they owe her uh, $600,000. Uh, 
<laughs> okay. Pretty nice for like uh, a half hour <laughs> interview. How do you get that job? Day you job. put an application for that. I want a job. What do you think, Josh? You heard about this going on this week. Yeah, I wouldn't have hired her. I mean, it's, you know, not for a news program. And some of the things that they have are opinion. But I, I still wouldn't have hired her for that. But, you know, most of it is supposed to be news-based and facts-based. And, I mean, look, Ron McDaniel is a liar and a fascist. I mean... <laughs> Well, you know, what happened so, was they do have uh, a former head of the RNC on mm -hmm. MSNBC, and he has his own program, yes. and that's Michael and he, Steele. He was the he well, was the color uh, guy, right? Chairman of the Republican National Committee before it, you know, was the was a, the fascist party. You know? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, when it was a political party that. Uh, <laughs> engaged with and debated against another political party on behalf of Americans, not on behalf of ideology. <laughs> so now that's where it's at. So, you know, Ronald McDaniel is not a respected person. I mean, to, to me, if you're going to have a uh, part of your programming, you know, to be opinion based mm -hmm. on these cable channels, I mean, that's OK. They're a private network. They can do what they would yeah. like. If you don't like it, you know, you could change the channel. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's fine. But you have to have people that are at least, uh, you know, representative of, you know, facts. I mean, you are a news organization. You know, your opinions cannot just be completely unfactual. Well, I mean, what their argument was about her was was yeah. not that she was the head of the Republican National Committee, but mm -hmm. that while she was, she played into the uh, whole idea yeah. that the election was stolen, yeah. and then yeah. she also went after MSNBC and the people working there and calling them liars and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they said, we don't want her around here. You know, Michael Steele's okay. He didn't say any of that stuff when he was the head of the RNC. Mm -hmm. yes. Michael Steele's pretty much quit the Republican Party, you know. Well, right. I mean, yes, there's a difference between, you know, again, saying that, uh, you know, uh, Social Security is broke and one side says we should raise taxes and the other side says people should work longer. Those are two legitimate fixes, okay, for a problem. Mm. Have it out right you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. i mean i know a lot of us wouldn't like one of them but that's what i'm saying that's what they said but that's a totally different realm than saying well mm -hmm. you know joe biden wasn't really elected donald trump won the election and they just they just switch rude a bunch of votes i mean okay where where is the evidence for that well they they just switch rude and then talk well, she, she was that's also not, on she was also on phone yeah. calls to various state entities yeah, trying to right. convince them that the uh, that the election was phone, fake. He was an active participant in a, you know, borderline coup. Yeah. Organized and supported by the organization that she was a chairman and, of. And I understand why the powers that be at NBC wanted to get somebody like that on their channel. It was because they had the election coming up, and this would kind of equalize things out and give the other side's opinion. But she wasn't the right person to do it with. You know, she was a sleaze yeah. bag. She was uh, she was part of the conspiracy. Yeah, yeah I agree. And you know, uh, I don't think he's as bad. But you know, I often turn on CNN at, at times and see Rick Santorum sitting there, and I say, mm, I really don't want to hear what that fascist said to say this evening either. You know, I mean. He's another person. Yeah, but I don't probably, think that Rick Santorum know. is hired as a, uh, at CNN, is hired mm -hmm. as a uh, consultant or as a, uh, right. you he's know, a, whatever. He's a, like a paid analyst. I don't, think, I don't think he's a paid analyst. I think he just comes on because he's Rick Santorum. Oh, no, they pay him. Oh, they he pay works, him? Oh, on, really? oh, yes. He's on yeah. CNN a lot. He's okay. there so that when they go around and do their thing, they can then go to him and he can pretty much say something completely different than what everybody else says. Yeah, yeah. Although they're none of those people or people that way. 
on mm-hmm. MSNBC. But then again, you won't find very many members of the Republican Party who will go on MSNBC. Yeah. And like we said, it's, it's you know, in Santorum's case or whoever, it is fine to have someone, you know, who, who says, you know, Social Security's broke, do this. Nope, we want to do that. Or to say, oh, I don't even think it's broke at all. Or what? Those are opinions, right? Those are opinions about whether or not you think something is a problem. Social those Security are, should be broke. Know, <laughs> those are opinions on how you would like to fix it. Mm-hmm. Those are opinions on you know this policy or that policy. Opinions on a news organization are not, oh, you know, uh, Joe Biden did not win the election. There were just votes switcherooed and people hacked into computers and all that. And again, like I just said, okay, all those things, if that happened, that's fine. Would you please show us how that happened and where and when? Mm-hmm. And I, they have nothing, yet they just repeat it over and over and over again, just like a network that got, you know, lost in a libel lawsuit. It's the same. Right type of thing. So I don't even know why MSNBC would want to even risk having someone come on and say those things on their airwaves, knowing that if they do, they can get themselves in some real issues. I mean, did they not learn anything from Fox's right. you know, uh, legal troubles? Yeah, I mean, I don't know why they would want to have someone on like that. Right. I mean, they might as well just have Putin come on and be a fucking paid analyst starting that. You know, I mean, <laughs> they talk about the war in Ukraine. I mean, that's the equivalent. I'm watching. <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, that's what it is. We're going to talk about the election. Let's ask this, this Ron McDaniel. And next, we're going to talk about the war in Ukraine. So we'll, we're going to have Putin come on and get, you know, mm-hmm. and, and analyze it for us. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, that's not, uh, that's not what a news organization should be doing. Right. I mean, you know, I, I think they hurt their integrity there. They took a step back. I mean, they fixed it and everything, you know, don't get me wrong, but like you said, only because most of their highest paid and most popular on-air talent went on air and, you know, <laughs> said that, you know, they we're not really going to put up with this. I mean, that's the only reason they did it, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know who was made the decision, uh, I mean, whoever that was, uh, you know, I mean, that's... I, I forget the name of the person, but... Yeah, I don't, no, but, they've got someone that ran the news division. I thought it was it like Phil Griffin or somebody like that. I mean, I don't know. They mention him from time to time, and he seems to be respected, and maybe this, maybe it wasn't, you know, this person... No, what they were complaining but, about is that the new people that are running like MSNBC are not yeah. news people. They're not news people. Mm-hmm. And so they're not aware of this kind of sensitivity towards somebody like her and what she presents as a negative to the network. And uh, they, they weren't arguing that she was a Republican. They had no argument about that. It was just her complicity, complicitness mm-hmm. in, in this entire false narrative that's been created by the Republican Party. Right. And yes, they, opi- like that's what we're saying. Opinions are one thing, but a a fictionalized narrative. I mean, she's not there to give opinion; she's there to give propaganda. And that those are two totally different things. And news organizations should not be in you know complicit in the spreading of what they know to be propaganda. Right. 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 I mean, to me, mm-hmm. I mean, opinion is opinion. Again, you know, the this program is broke, and this is how I think we should fix it. Next person, yep, that program is broke, but your idea is stupid. That'll just make it worse. Here's our idea. Next person, program's not broke at all. Everything's fine, right? I mean, you know, okay. Those are opinions. Well, but. you know, you want a Republican. Uh, if you want to hire somebody for MSNBC, go get Mitt Romney. Yeah, they're, you know. Other- a right. guy who uh, has maintained his honesty during throughout all of this, and who, if you had a debate on MSNBC about, say, Social Security, would probably take the Republican slant on it. And isn't that what you're looking for? But you don't need somebody who was just nothing but an apologist for Donald Trump. Plain that guy has stolen the party. Huh? Yeah, well, yeah. He's stolen the party? 
Oh, he's yeah. hijacked the Horribly, party. Yes. He's hijacked it. That's what's so terrible about it. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see how it works out. But, I mean, you know, they appear to be on a slow path to their own destruction. You know? And, well, I mean, if they don't win this election. Well, I mm. mean, Yeah. Right. There's going to be a lot of... be good, right? I mean... There's going to be more than enough mea culpas to go around, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, they won't have anyone to, you know, blame but themselves. I mean, it's... it's. Yeah, but you know something? If, 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 if uh, um, he runs, or he's going to run, although that's not even a given, but if he runs mm -hmm. uh, for president... And he loses. Um, I want to hear all the deniers after the fact of how, well, I wasn't really for him. Right. You know, I just had to back the nominee, blah, 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 blah. No, mm -hmm. you actually ruined your party to help this sleazebag. Yeah. This is right. a gangster. You know, he never this gangster. Say that kind of thing. Huh? He won't say that kind of response. What? He'll always say it was a it, some. It, no, I'm uh, saying all these else other. I'm cheated on it. No, I'm saying these other people, not Trump. I'm saying other people who will be backing Trump, who after the fact will say, "Well, I wasn't really for him." Yeah, right. You know, and will change their tune because they don't want to be put in that category. But they've already and they already changed their tune at the very beginning because they say they're not for him, and he's he's just Lee's bag, and then. Then he attacks them, and then he says that they change their tune, and then they want a job from him. Uh, what's you know? his name down in Florida? Um, yeah, little, Santa's. little, little, yeah. little. Mm -hmm. What's his name? The Marco Santa's. Rubio, little Marco. Yeah, but I mean Marco Rubio is an example. He's now kissing Trump's ass, and what was <laughs> Trump saying about him, little Marco? You yeah, know. Had little uh, how about how about the uh, uh, senator and uh, Ted Cruz and? Uh, He's he linked him with the JFK conspiracy. He linked his father with the JFK. Yeah, I mean, conspiracy. you can't make this up. Like when I'm on, I don't. I still can't fathom the shit that flies out of his mouth, and they go along with it. Well, well, now if you ask Ted Cruz who he's for. He's squarely in the Trump camp. He, he, he not, he not only him? Trump not only put down his father, he put down his wife. Yeah, his I'm wife. Trump would put down my mother. Yeah. I would make. I want to punch him in the nose. I don't care how old he is. Yeah, Chris I mean, Christie's the only guy who has dead balls has to go after him. Yeah, Chris Christie. Chris Christie's the only guy who has balls over there. He says, "I will not back him." Yeah, you know, and he blasts him all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and by the way, he's supposed to because when he was running for the nomination, he yeah. he he agreed that he would back whoever the party backed, and he just said, "I'm just not going to do it now. Forget it." You know. What are they going to do? Sue him? <laughs> and you know what, Alex? Too. It's at least he's a big man, Christy. But he's saying, "Listen, I made a mistake back in this guy." Right. At least he's a big man to say, "Hey, I fucked well, up." Well, yes, he is a big man. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, big man. yeah. But yeah. All right. <laughs> but last, last, time, last time when Trump became That's president, true. he wanted a <laughs> job from him, right? Yeah. So he wanted the VP, right? Uh, who? Uh, oh, yeah. Chris Christie before yeah. the yeah. Well, look, I could we'll see how at a certain point there were people. I mean, before all of this happened, that there were people who thought, ah, maybe Trump will be okay. You know, maybe he'll, you know, he'll have a respect for the office and he will do right by it and so on. But it turned out he didn't. And any Republican who can back him now has to have their feet held to the flames once he loses in November. And I, there's a good chance he's going to lose. And uh, I think so, too, because I think there's a lot of independents out there who are not participating in any of the polls. Well, uh, yeah. I get the polls. I don't fucking, I don't participate in it. I don't say I don't you know, who I'm going to vote for or not. And I think there's enough people out there who are going to say, you know, no, you are too divisive. I don't want to go back to all the riots. Fuck you. I'm going to vote for Joe Lieberman. Or, yeah. I'm sorry to Joe Lieberman's going to be hard to vote for. Oh, he's really hard. <laughs> he's just he's in the news today. He's dead. You got to bring him up. By the, by the way, if anybody listens to, our, uh, listens to our 24-7, yeah. uh, after my, um, I think it's, I can't remember where I put it exactly, but it's around uh, after the Michael Snyder movie reviews, 
I slipped in an interview I did uh, back in, uh, God, when did I do that? God, it was in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, hold on a second, I'll tell you in a second. It was 8, 19, 11, in 2011, where I interviewed Joe Lieberman. Mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, and I, I put the interview up. It's about 17 minutes long. And he's an he was an interesting guy, you know. Yeah. I mean, he was as as Democrats go, pretty much a good liberal. But uh, he, as Democrats go, he was pretty much a good Republican. Well, no, I, I, you can't say that exactly. I think you're saying that because uh, the Republicans wanted him to run with John McCain or somebody, yeah. you know. And he, but he, he, he. But that would have been a good ticket. Well, I mean, he, <laughs> he. There were certain people he liked, and he wasn't going to deny that he liked them. And that he felt they were good, uh, good uh, Republicans, um, and uh, you know, it, it, Lieberman's a weird guy, okay? And he had, like what? Huh? He's, He's also a like dead guy. Well, he was weird politically, you know. Okay. But you, the one thing he, he was was outside the box. He thought oh, outside okay. the box, and he was totally yeah. honest. You know? like Would yeah. you agree with me on that, Josh? Well, yeah, I mean, he was, he was, you know, uh, just a little independent minded. He was not as attached to uh, a particular party's ideology on every issue. Right. You know, he could have been just very right -wing leaning, you know, he no, could have I don't think, I don't think he would, would you call him right wing leaning, Josh? I mean, from what you remember of Lieberman? Well, he had some areas where you know he he did he campaigned for so, mccain um, which you know i right. get they were friends and everything but you know you he liked he it, liked mccain and quite frankly if it hadn't been it, for sarah palin i would have thought a little bit about mccain myself yes me too you know yeah, I mean, he did you know but he also ran you know for vice president with al gore so I yeah, mean, you know that yeah. that's a pretty broad spectrum, right? You know, it <laughs> yeah. depended on the. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It depended on the issue. I mean, time of day. <laughs> you know, I, I guess, you know, you can't argue sometimes with that. I mean, I have some of that in me. Right? I mean, you know, there are certain things. Yeah. People on the left or the Democratic Party whine about, but. I've, well, there were things been, about the Democratic Party that completely with. turned me off. You know, I wasn't 100% for Obama while he was president. I felt that in his first term, it was pretty much amateur time. In the second term, he had learned how to be president. And you even kind of gave me a wince on that one, Josh. Oh, no, that wasn't for that. But, I, I mean, no, I mean, he, you know, mm -hmm. I can understand that. I mean, there are certain issues like that with the party or whatever, sometimes on, you know, like, defense or certain social issues or whatever that you know my position is not uh either the same as theirs or, or i just have some limits to how far i would go with it you know but mm -hmm. you know that i mean honestly you know lieberman's could kind of get on you know democrats nerves with it which i can understand because some of it was a little bit you know ridiculous if i remember right but you know i mean it, at least someone's thinking for themselves you know which Right now, <laughs> pretty Josh. much nobody is. I mean, you know, so, I mean, you yeah. know, you yeah. basically have one party that just no one's thinking for themselves. They literally do what they're told. Yeah, well, Josh, with your historical yeah. like uh, your your knowledge, if Joe Lieberman gets in, uh, I'm sorry, Joe Biden. He he does, yeah. <laughs> if he gets in for one more term, is he going to be the longest serving? person in White House history for doing two terms vice president and then two terms president? Has I anybody think ever so. served I think more so. in the White House? I think so, but listen, the theme is playing and we got to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, um, uh, I don't think, I can't think of anybody else who would have served. 16 years. 16 years in that, in the, in the executive in the branch. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, hey, listen, that's it. Uh, we've run out of time here. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, Josh, always good to have you here. Brian, wonderful to have you here, of course. Uh, Alan, of course you're here. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And uh, <laughs> hey, Jason, you should call us more often. Jeez, you know. 
Once in a blue moon. I'm old. It's too late. Uh, huh? I said I'm old. It's too late. It's too late. <laughs> and also, thank you to Tony. Thank you to everybody. Why don't you all give yourself a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. And there they go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Uh, next is, of course, uh, Amy Manuel with The Intersection. She'll be taking your calls on Skype at GabNet Live. I'll see you again tomorrow night, same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>